the co-author of Town Acquisition Excellence, next on the RecTech Podcast. Welcome to RecTech, the podcast where recruiting and technology intersect. Each month, you'll hear from vendors shaping the recruiting world, along with recruiters who'll tell you how they use technology to hire talent. Now, here's your host, the mad scientist of online recruiting, Chris Russell. All right, Rec Techies, welcome to the only podcast that helps employers and recruiters connect with more candidates through technology inspired conversations. Mastering recruitment technology is the key to hiring great talent. That's why this show exists. All right, Bas van der Hattert is a professional speaker, consultant, and trainer with a particular focus on using technology to improve recruitment. Based in Soest, the Netherlands, he has more than 20 years' experience, and his, consult his consulting clients include Dutch Rail, Dutch Post, and Twente University. His new book, co-authored with uh, Kevin Wheeler, who some of you know, is out, entitled Talent Acquisition Excellence Using Digital Capabilities and Analytics to Improve Recruitment. Boss, welcome to the show, man. It's great to have you. Awesome to be here. So what's the book about and who's it for? Start well, there. The, the book is for everybody who wants to improve their knowledge about talent acquisition. Um, basically, it's written for recruitment leaders or aspiring recruitment leaders um, and all over the world. Um, Kevin is, of course, an American. I'm a European. Kevin has a lot of experience in Southeast Asia. I've been training in the Middle East for some time. So we try to incorporate everything we see all around the world and try to learn from, hey, if this region is doing it this way, why wouldn't it work there? Or doesn't it work there? Um, and we just uh, take a global perspective and try to, to make it localized as well, because yeah. we understand that different laws and different markets function differently. What's the biggest difference between the U.S. recruiting in the U.S. and like recruiting in the Netherlands, for example? Well, the, um, I think the labor laws are very different. Um, uh, it's really hard to fire somebody once you hire them in the Netherlands, while in America uh, you fire quite easy, which makes it uh, easier to hire, basically, uh, which is weirdly enough, despite the fact that it gets a lot more attention, America is a lot better when it comes to labor market discrimination. Yours is like f way lower than ours even though we believe we're that inclusive, that's actually one of the reasons that we suck at it. <laughs> um, uh, and you, we work a lot of part-time. I think the, uh, the Dutch market has been tight for some time. We know that uh, in America, they're now talking about a very tight labor market at 5% unemployment. Um, we actually consider 5% to be the equilibrium and we've been at like 3% unemployment for quite some time. Hmm. Um, demographically, you, the Americans are letting in a lot more immigrants, which is why you're one of the few countries which isn't extremely <clears throat> great or silvered or whatever term you want to use for it. Um, our labor market is completely crashing because the right wing is winning all over Europe because we don't want immigrants yet. We can't fill the jobs that we currently have. Yeah. It kind of doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, I think uh, if you need people, you need to let them in the country and let them work. Uh, if you want to fill these jobs, uh, it's kind of a, a strange uh, dynamic dilemma we have here. Um, uh, yeah. I, um, I, I heard once too, uh, like in Japan, talking about the differences between different countries, they still value the paper resume over there. Is that is that true? Do you know or? Um, I don't know that much about Japan. I do know that Japan is unique in pretty much every sense of the world. I mean, they've got the highest level of robots per person in Japan because they don't let in any immigrants. Um, they still very much value uh, um, lifetime employment. I know Japan is one of the very few countries where um having a family owned business uh, doesn't eventually deteriorate uh, because uh, um you don't let in the quality at the top because a family member has to do because they actually then appoint a ceo and adopt as a family the ceo legally adopt like a 40 or a 50 year old to be their child because it needs to be family owned so they just adopt people 
I mean, Japan is a crazy, crazy country, uh, what I know. I know that in, for example, Germany, they still, even though if you work like 10 or 15 years, they still send your grades from university along with uh, really? a resume, which, <laughs> by the way, makes Germany the less la discriminating country in the world. Because all of a sudden, there's a different set of data next to your resume. And your name isn't the most strange thing on there, basically. Yeah. So, interesting. yeah. Interesting. Um, Very interesting, yeah. By the way, there's a great show on, uh, I think it's on, on HBO, called Tokyo Vice. And it's about this American kid who goes over there and becomes a reporter at a Japanese newspaper. It's kind of interesting how they, how the, he, he works that, you know, that scene. And uh, it's, it's a really, really good show. Check it out. All right. Um, so, from your perspective, Boz, well, what's the biggest problem in TA tech right now? I mean, to me, you know, it's the job search is is still broken, always has been. It seems to be getting worse these days. But what's your perspective? Um, I think the biggest problem is actually that internally we're trying to always fix broken pro uh, systems with technology. So we've got a process which doesn't work. And I don't know where it doesn't work, but within companies, it's uh, we try to fix broken processes with technology and then are surprised that the technology doesn't work mm -hmm. uh, and we blame the tool. Um, uh, one of the most beautiful cases right now in the Netherlands is actually ship hole. Uh, a year and a half ago, um, you had to arrive at the airport at least three hours in the hope to catch your flight because they had personnel shortages, which were like insane. Uh, you could easily wait two hours before your bag was unloaded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they hired a new head of recruitment, uh, somebody I've known for 20 years. I mean, we, we basically literally grew up in this industry together. And um, she fixed it by fixing the processes, which also meant fixing uh, the pay in some cases, or maybe it was more the perception of the pay. I'm not sure that they actually really <laughs> upped the amount they're spending, but at least the perception of it was we give in to the unions, here's some extras, here's some bonuses, things like that. Um, and they they simply build a process which worked and use technology to help the process. So um, the reverse, I guess, right? Yeah, and, and they, they, they to give you an example, uh, ship hall, we all think everybody at the airport works at the airport, but actually they work at like 12 subcontractors. Yeah. Um, you know, even the security doesn't work for the airport. Uh, the security works for security firms or for uh, uh, the Dutch military who do the passport checks, you know, the customs. Um, and they said, listen, whatever you guys do, we are now... Pretending to be one company, we are now have one global career site where you can figure out as a candidate which jobs fit you. And maybe you're not fit to be a security guard for whatever reason. Then you might be a luggage handler or the other way around, you know. And um, it turns out that there was no shortage of people who wanted to work there. But they just couldn't find the employer which was actually employing for that specific job. So now they don't just have working at the company ship hall, mm. they have working at ship hall, the airport. And they basically made it mandatory for even the airlines. If you're looking for people, you got to plug into our website. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, ama it's amazing how if you look at just take a step back from a TA environment, you could look at the process itself. It just, if you just rethink this with a human brain, you know, you can actually fix a lot of these problems. Yeah. And it's, if, if you look at it, um, I know the Eindhoven region, for example, and I'm sorry for your Americans to give all the Dutch. I, examples, been, I, but, I know what that means. Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. But in Eindhoven, you've got ASML, which is now the, the mo one of the most valuable companies in Europe, you know, producing the machines that produce microchips. You've got Philips, you've got all these companies. So, in the financial crisis, in the, in the Great Recession, they had to let people go. But it turned out that was very um, asymmetrous. So they actually loaned people to suppliers. And because of that, product innovation got a huge boost. Because all of a sudden, these suppliers knew 
how to improve their products so that their end customer who lent them stuff that they uh, couldn't use at that moment uh, uh, were using that now they made actually they made a program of it that you can do like six months or a year internships at suppliers and at customers lending each other people um, and improving their entire products and uh, uh, and also the dependencies on each other which as a supplier you're really happy that your product is so perfectly fit for your customer that he won't even consider going anywhere else <laughs> because you just made the perfect product and it doesn't cost you anything more but you now understand why that o-ring needs to be like six millimeters to the left and the entire product gets better you know things like that yeah um and they've actually been looking at and i'm they can still improve a lot but they've been looking at it from an ecosystem perspective they don't use enough technology as far as i'm concerned to 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 support it but at least they see each other as much as friends as they do competitors. So um, they're also talking like, how do we get those, you know, on the Dutch labor market, we're competitors, but we'll jointly go to uh, uh, MIT in Boston if they have a recruiting conference to s tell them, hey, listen, guys, Eindhoven is quite a nice place to go to. Um, they actually now support a major soccer team there as a region, because they know that the highly coveted expats want some entertainment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they want top quality entertainment. And actually, they're now playing uh, a next round Champions Leagues, which they hadn't qualified for in decades. Looking for your next HR technology role? Go to your browser, type in hrtechjob.com and browse hundreds of jobs with the best HR technology vendors. HR tech professionals finally have a dedicated job marketplace to find work or be found. Sign up for job alerts or post a resume. Discover jobs with companies like Workday, Phenom, HiBob, Deal, and more. You'll even find HR tech roles with employers in case you want to work with managing HCM or HRIS platforms. HR Tech Job, the only job market for HR technology careers. Join us at hrtechjob.com. Well, let's get back to TA Tech. Um, wh what do you see that are the biggest improvements in, in the space right now? What comes to mind there? Well, um, what I see is most money is still going, as far as I'm concerned, into recruitment marketing. We see the most advancements in programmatic advertising. And I see there's actually a big difference between programmatic in the U.S. and Europe. Because what in, is the US, uh, in the U.S., your job boards do programmatic as well. In Europe, programmatic is mainly on social media. So we do programmatic on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, and, and uh, uh, those kinds of with, with job ads, with job ads, yeah. <laughs> now, does it, let me ask. Let's let me let's dive into that a bit. Because um, over here on social media, I think that though those clicks are there's a little bit less quality in terms of those people aren't looking for jobs. They just see a job, they may click it because they may be interested. But if they're on a job board, that's more inten more intentional click, right? Um, how's the quality of that click over there on social media? From what I hear, but in all fairness, these this is mostly vendor data. The quality is actually quite good. but And that's also because um, on a job board, you only meet people who are actively looking for a job. Mm -hmm. which basically is such a limited number of people. As I said, the unemployment is extremely low. Um, there, so you, you have to reach the passive candidates um, you, and, and you have to reach, uh, uh, and in many cases, the people who are actually sort of active or really wanting to know this job are often already so disappointed in the labor market uh, because they've been discriminated against a lot or because uh, the, the ads promise everything from flexible working and it means that you have to be flexible, you know, it's instead of the employers, things like that. Um, that uh, uh, the, the quality is quite good, 
and um, especially if you compare it to you know most job boards still have post and pray and uh, prices on indeed are often a lot higher than on facebook or instagram if you know yep. how to target yep so uh, even if your quality is lower if your cost per click is a lot lower because you're actually really good at targeting the right people and understanding the algorithms because that's probably the most important thing you need somebody who truly understands how facebook works um and and how to make i don't know seven or eight different campaigns running at the same time because facebook algorithms doesn't don't work like uh, indeed algorithms yeah how will ai affect all this what's your what's your take on that uh, give me some some massively some massively thoughts. of course right now everybody is talking ai and it's it's um i think a lot of the AI is AI bullshit. We're doing the same thing, but all of a sudden it's uh, uh, great to tell people it's AI. On the other hand, um, I've seen some stuff uh, uh, in, I know, call it embryonic phase right now, which if it goes like it should go, it's going to be amazing. You see um, on the programmatic side, you are now seeing not just, and that's the difference I think with, for example, the US programmatic on job boards, you're always looking for the active candidate. Right now, I see companies targeting students in their last year of their uh, college, already making them aware of the fact that there are very unknown companies, you know, medium-sized companies with zero employer brand, active in their in their industry showing them some ads that by the time they actually graduate um it's a household name for them and yeah. they uh, and then ooh by pure coincidence ai uh, uh, made the targeting oh this guy is graduating now or this girl's graduating now let's show them an actual job you know um your local hospital You've already seen twice a video on how cool it is to work when you were uh, finishing nursing school. Um, we've just seen you update finish nursing school and the algorithm says, hey, we've got some nursing jobs for you. You know, things like that. Um, I've seen an amazing uh, uh, tool right now to actually analyze uh, job interviews. Um, and not just note taking, but actually also taking out competencies, uh, uh, drivers, you know, mental drivers, soft skills, and giving you the report on uh, how does this person actually uh, uh, score on the big five and stuff like that. Um, all AI related. Yeah. How will all this affect the jobs of sourcers, recruiters, recruitment marketers? <clears throat> you know, in three to five years. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think technology will replace, and, and uh, I'm quoting my co-author, Kevin Wheeler here, technology can replace about 80% of all the tasks recruiters are doing. That doesn't mean recruiters will be replaced, but that means that we can focus on the 20% of the things that actually add the most value, like engaging with candidates, like analyzing the data to make the best actual fit for, for the organization, like being a talent advisor to your hiring manager. Um, and I also think that a lot of recruiters are extremely mediocre at best at their job, and those will lose their job. There will be less recruiters, no question about it. But the ones who are really good at their job will actually have much nicer jobs and flourish. I think you just said it there. Like the, the new recruiter job will be a talent advisor. That's that makes a lot of sense, actually. Now that I'm thinking about it, so maybe on something yeah. there. I uh, yeah, no, it's definitely a talent advisor. But I also think there will be a and, that, and that's a really that's an involved job. It's a technologist. It's an analyst. It's a salesperson, right? Well, I, the question is, will those be the same people, uh, or will that be specialist? I actually mm -hmm. think that. We will have, for example, a data analytics hub within recruitment who are uh, optimizing the AIs who do the recruitment marketing. 
uh, I don't think that's part of the talent advisor. The talent advisor job is the person talking to the hiring manager and figuring out how to uh, um, basically calibrate the algorithm or how to interpret the data from the selection assessments. And um, what I've actually seen, uh, I, I worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, did a consulting job there. And we started using first phase assessments. So every every applicant got a digital assessment as soon as they applied. And we saw the, the um, conversations with the hiring managers change from um, what do I need? Uh, I need another Bert because Bert is leaving or I need another, another Sean because Sean is leaving to, all right, we see that you already have a lot of analytical capabilities in your uh, um, team, but a little less communication skills. Shall we say this is the minimum of uh, uh, um, minimum uh, um, analytical capabilities because that's part of the job. But if somebody reaches that minimum, shall we go for somebody with higher communication skills so your team is more complete? So you are better to talk to other teams. And we saw those conversations change. And unfortunately, government pilots, uh, we didn't get budget to, to, to renew the pilots, et cetera, et cetera. But now uh, when, when we had to quit the pilot, all of a sudden the hiring managers who were in, uh, up front were like, oh, I don't need an assessment. I can do that really well, are now like, how am I supposed to look at a candidate if I don't have his personality report? You know. <laughs> Where, where did my big five report go? How do I know now? It's, it's amazing how quickly that changed from I don't need all this shit, I don't trust assessments to, oh, this was really, really useful to do better interviews, yeah. for example. Um, where, where did my interview guide go was one of the <laughs> questions. You know, yes, yeah, sorry, we had to cancel the pilot. And, you know, the interview guide was based upon the strengths and weaknesses of a candidate. Right. As opposed to the profile. You got a, a favorite chapter or story in the book? Um, well, there's a few I really loved writing um, because I wrote um, what I call talent acquisition fiction. So we wrote scenarios in the book of non-existing companies on how they did their talent acquisition, how they evolved as companies. Uh, uh, I wrote a fictional uh, a story about a vaccine developer. Um, I wrote a fictional story about uh, um, um, a retailer, you know, a food retailer, uh, about a vertical farmer, about an electrical uh, aircraft care builder. Construct <clears throat> and I loved writing those, incorporating pieces of what we said we were doing. And especially to emphasize that there is no one way to do recruitment right. However, there's a lot of ways to do it wrong, but there are several ways to do it really well, as long as it's in line with your entire talent strategy. And that's, um, I, lo I love to write just story, you know, the, the actual art of storytelling about this works this way, this worked that way. Um, yeah. What's the one, one takeaway you want the readers to have after... Uh... Picking this book up, um, probably that. Like I said, there is no one way to do it right. There's a lot of different ways as long as you stay true to your organizational culture, um, and you implement your talent acquisition practices according to who you want to be. You know, if you are a company which is used to growing your own staff internally, you need to hire for potential. Now, if you've never done that, you shouldn't try to start doing that. Um, and if I may, uh, so um, I in my company there, uh, in my my uh, um, family, there's a family-owned company. It's been around for 130 years now. It's it's was founded by my great grandfather. Currently, my cousin is running it. Okay. And this is a a, a true family-owned company which treats their staff like family. They've ne literally never fired a single person ever because you do not fire family. <laughs> and then people are like, yeah, yeah, but there's crises. 
This company survived two world wars. Let's be very honest. We've had our share of crises. Hmm. You still don't fire anybody. Um, you take care of the families of the people that work for you. And we'll make it work. And it's it's paid back. And they're, they don't really have a talent acquisition strategy, uh, at least not according to my cousin who doesn't understand what I do. <laughs> but on the other hand... Um, they once had a guy who worked for 60 years for the organization. Imagine that, starting at age 15 and actually passing away at age 75, still working for the company because he didn't want to retire. Wow. His son and his grandson are also working for the company. Uh, and she says, we don't have a talent acquisition strategy. I'm like, actually, you do. You treat your staff so well that his son never actually envisioned working anywhere else. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. funny. My my uh, my uncle worked at Pepperidge Farm for like I don't know thirty something years, and he was a lifer there. I'm like, hey, that's not going to happen anymore in the next generation of workers. That they're they're going to change jobs like twenty times in their life, probably. Um, some many are, but actually, at my uh, uh, like I said, at my family uh, uh, at the fir firm that my great grandfather started, they still have uh, ten years or forty years on oh. regularly. They so and and it's only like a a twenty five thirty person operation, and yeah. they don't want to grow beyond that. But a, a forty year tenures are quite normal there. Yeah. So it's still possible. You just have to make sure that people understand. I remember my uncle who passed away a couple of years ago once complaining to my dad that people were now leaving and they, they the youth doesn't have any stamina anymore. To which my dad asked, like, how long are they staying? And he's like. Yeah, this woman only stayed for seven years on my uh, 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 administration desk. My dad was like, my longest tenure at the company I'm running is actually, except for <laughs> my dad who was there for 40 years as well, it's, it's like five years. I'm happy if they say five, you know? Well, Boz, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate you coming on the show. Again, the book is called Talent Acquisition Excellence. You can pick it up on Amazon. Uh, you can pick it up on koganpage.com and use the code koganpage20 to get 20% off, right? Yep. Awesome. Well, uh, we'll put the links in the show notes there for the audience. And uh, that will do it for this episode of the Rec Tech Podcast. <laughs> be sure to follow us on the socials, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, via the at Rec Tech Media handle. See every uh, video and blog we publish. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in, everyone. And remember, always be recruiting. Another episode of Rec Tech is in the books. Follow Chris on Twitter at Chris Russell or visit rectechmedia.com where you can find the audio and links for this show on our blog. Rectech Media helps keep employers and recruiters up to date through our podcasts, webinars, and articles. So be sure to check out our other sites, recruiting headlines, and HR podcasters to stay on top of recruiting industry trends. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon on the next episode of Rectech, the recruiting technology podcast.